All right, folks, good afternoon. It is Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. Today is a very, very awesome show for me. Um, obviously, um, we at Real Progressives spend our time talking in heterodox economic circles. Um, we've had Warren Mosler on the show many times. Warren is a friend of the program, a friend of mine, but we've never had the opportunity to have Professor Steve Keen join us before. Now, interestingly enough, there are some minor differences between the two camps and, and some interesting thoughts on what is called MCT uh, and MMT. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna bring each one of them out and we're gonna go ahead and have ourselves a conversation. So without further ado, I'm gonna bring the guests on. Professor Keen, Warren, welcome to Real Progressives. Thank you. Thank you. So, so go ahead, Steve. With with that, let's let's talk to you for a moment. Tell us about what your concerns are in terms of uh, modern monetary theory and its relationship to the work you're doing. Because right now, okay. obviously, there are some differences in between there, and and it'd be good to flesh those out. Okay. Well, there's probably there's a pity that Warren's not here to listen because. Um... As I said in my comment on my Patreon blog, there are basically two areas where I, uh, though I agree with the foundations of MMT, I think they don't take those foundations far enough uh, and in one sense, and they take them too far in the other. So the area they don't take them far enough in is that if you look at the analysis explaining how banks create money and how governments create money, uh, then exactly the same logic applies, applies to the international trade sector. That if you have a... Um, if you have if banks lending out more than they get back in repayments, they're creating money that way, but of course, creating equivalent amount of debt, so no net equity for the uh, private non-bank sector. If you have the government running, uh, spending more than it gets back in taxation or takes back in taxation, then therefore you have government money creation. Um, if you have exports exceeding imports, it's a convoluted process, but what actually involves in that is the exporter uh, who is receiving money in a foreign currency, let's, let's use uh, uh, the UK and Europe rather than America to get away from the issues about the reserve currency. If a German exporter, uh, if the German net exporting to the UK, then the UK is buying German goods with British pounds, which the several ways it can get there. But if you have a, imagine a Mercedes Benz being bought with a purchase of pounds in, in Britain, then those pounds get shipped to Germany, whether the they're the, uh, possessed by Mercedes-Benz, they tender that money to their private bank. Their private bank tenders those pounds to the central bank. The central bank then is obliged to credit the account of the Mercedes-Benz with, 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 with uh, euro. So what you get out of it, I think Warren's come back on his uh, mobile phone here. Uh, what you get out yeah, of I'm it not... is yeah. Yeah, that the exports force the domestic, uh, the, the so surplus of exports over imports force the central bank of the exporting surplus country to produce more of its domestic currency, where that's uh, backed by the increase in the reserves it has of foreign currencies. And to me, that's a third way of creating money. Now, if you, you have you a country... Can you explain that again? Yeah. Um, what, what I'm saying, but this is where I think MNP doesn't take its own logic far enough, Warren. Uh, and okay. that is to say that if you say that banks create money by lending more than they get back in repayments, then you have money right. creation, but of course, it, it's identically equivalent to increase in debt. So no net increase in equity for the private non-bank sector. The government, as we both know, the government spends more than it takes back in taxation, then it creates net equity and money for the private sector. If you have, okay, a, yeah. if you have an export surplus, then the same thing applies yeah. to the government because if you have a, if your country is is net exporting, then it is getting okay. Let's, an ex, yeah, it's let's getting stop money for a minute. Okay. Yeah. So, so let's say Germany is exporting to the United States, selling Volkswagens, and <clears throat> I pay for the Volkswagen with dollars. The Fed will indirectly debit my account and credit Volkswagen's account with dollars, right? At mm -hmm. at the bank. At the at the Volkswagen's member bank, let's say it's Deutsche Bank. Yeah. Yep. So my bank, J.P. Morgan, gets debited. Deutsche Bank's reserve account gets credited with dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So then, what happens? What's after that? Well, then what happens if you wait back? So far, just like any. But if that account's in Germany, 
then those dollars are taken by well, Mercedes wait, 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 Benz. Yeah, the owner, the owner of the account can be in Germany, but it's it, the bank itself is a in cyberspace, I guess, but it's a Fed member and has a reserve account at the Fed. So you're Deutsche still Bank's thinking about Fed that. Reserve. Let's drop the American example and take the UK, mate, because this is where I say okay, let's, uh, MMT the UK. is too, so too, too, too American centric. If you have, okay, if so you have a, a British firm, yeah, a the British, UK. Firm, British consumer, yeah. buys a Mercedes Benz with British pounds, yeah. which are given to the yeah. given to the domestic wing of Mercedes Benz in the UK. When the right. Mercedes Benz then consolidates those profits globally, it transmits that money back to the pounds, back to Germany. Mercedes Benz. No, 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 no. No, no, it counts for them, but the pounds stay at their bank in the UK until they spend the money on something or sell it or transfer it. It doesn't go anywhere. It can only be oh, in a Oh, come on. <laughs> no, if you're, if you're a multinational, you're, you, you, want to, and you're, you want to consolidate back at your head office before you distribute the money. It's going to go back. Yeah, you can, consolidate for, you can consolidate for accounting purposes, but you have to have an account in pounds if that's how you got paid. So if you got paid in pounds, you paid, I, I, I'm buying, buying and selling in pounds all the time because I'm buying it internationally all the right. time. And what is going on? My pounds, when they get received by, let's say, a software manufacturer in Italy, those pounds get converted yeah. to euros to benefit the account of the... No, no, oh, no, 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 no. Somebody has to sell those pounds and buy euros. They don't yeah, get converted. They get sold and purchased. Yeah, they get sold. That's, that's fine. Pounds. What I'm saying is, if, I, right, if well, I'm stop buying... Here. Right. So the pounds get sold. Let's do this one step at a time here. Let's get all the debits and credits in place. The pounds mm -hmm. get sold to someone else, and that account in the UK gets transferred from that company who sold you the goods and the Italian company to somebody else who was selling, uh, not lira, but euro and buying pounds. And the euro account... The names on the euro account switch and the names on the pound account switch, but the funds themselves don't move anywhere. They have to move. Why else would well, an Italian can... software developer be selling stuff to me and accepting pounds in payment if he's not going to get euros in his bank account in Italy? He gets euros, but he gets them from an account, a euro account that's already there with, that somebody has used to sell those euros and buy his pounds. But what I'm saying is the, the increase in his account is motivated by the fact that he sold an export to me in Britain. Now, absolutely, that, absolutely. Okay, but that's what Euro, I'm saying. That, but that is then causing money to be created in Italy. Uh, no. No, Deposit in Italy, all that happened, all that happened was euros went up in Italy. What, a deposit in, in account Italy, goes up in, in Italy. Euro. Yeah, but another one goes down. Whoever bought the pounds, their euro account, the, ones who bought, the guy who bought the pounds from them, his euro account goes down and his pound account goes up. If the money sent by the central to the central bank, then the central bank is going to credit. Right. No, no the, the central bank has... doesn't do the federal. Go ahead. Are you saying there's no money created by international trade surpluses? Uh, well, I don't know how we're defining money, but what I'm saying is the central banks do not convert currencies. Okay. That, that's all done in a marketplace. It's not conversion. If somebody buys a currency and in exchange for another. Central, you banks have large, central banks have large reserves of foreign currency, do they not? Where do they get okay, them? Okay, uh, some do, some do. The U.S. does not. The, the European Central Bank has a residual hoard from, mm -hmm. well, each country has it from before when they were individual countries. But to acquire those reserves, that central bank will go out in the market and sell its own currency to buy the foreign exchange reserves. Yeah, but what they I'm saying is, to, like, I, I, yeah, I cannot see still how in the... Action. I cannot see, I'm working in terms of trying to mathematically model this in my stylized Minsky software. Yeah. And I cannot see yeah. how I can show, if I have one country which has had the ex surplus of exports over imports, I cannot yeah. not show that that country uses that surplus of exports over imports to motivate the central bank to create more of its domestic currency. Because if I'm buying a sort of okay. if, paying if, 99, if, 99, 99, let me finish the sentence. If I'm yeah. paying 99 euro to buy a software package off, a, off somebody in Italy, at some point, 99 yeah. euros turns up in his account. Now, that yeah. I see is a 99 euro net increase in the amount of money in circulation in Italy, courtesy of that particular transaction. And when you aggregate okay. the global level, a country running a trade surplus like Germany has an enormous in source of German mark creation coming out of the fact that it's running a 10% of GDP surplus. 
only to the extent that the government intervenes in the market, to the extent that the central bank, uh, such as you know the Bundesbank under Marx, would sell Marx and buy dollars to keep the Marx from getting strong, then they are creating new Marx, okay, that weren't there before in the private sector. But uh, that's only a, a result of cent direct central bank intervention in the foreign exchange markets, which is not automatic. That's discretionary it's not automatic. policy. I know it's not automatic, but I'm saying it still is one of the potential sources of money creation. And if we're saying yeah, central bank intervention, central bank intervention is what I call off balance sheet deficit spending. But it's yeah. not done for the whole trade surplus. Look, Germany got a large trade surplus, and the Bundesbank hasn't accumulated any dollars, and they haven't created any euros in the process. It's all done in a private sector. You know, all the transactions were private sector. They never got yeah, to the no, it's an increasing ECB. amount of money in the private sector. What's that? It's no, increasing the private the sector, the euro. When Volkswagen sells dollars to buy euros, uh, it does it with somebody else in the private sector whose euro count goes down. And sells Mercedes, count goes down. It's selling Mercedes Benz to buy pounds as well. That's my point. That's if my you're producing point. and selling a surplus of your manufacturing, right. let's market. walk it through. The Mercedes, yeah. Let me walk it through. They sell the Mercedes to you, they get the pounds. They sell the pounds and buy euro with another private sector agent who had the euro. So his euro account goes down and, and Mercedes goes up. And that's why the euro has been going up. That's why the euro has been going up. One of the reasons, the other because it's undervalued the German currency dramatically with trade for the rest of the world and internally in Europe itself. Yeah, but that's, that's a, a fun, that's a, a fun a trade surplus is a fundamental force that drives up a currency. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And what I'm saying is that it's also a fundamental source that helps generate some of the domestic money, which is why Germany has both falling private debt and falling public debt while an increasing money supply, because of that 10% trade surplus. And to me, that's a major source of the revenue that lets a country industrialize and manufacture and develop its manufacturing. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you feel is the key difference in, in, in understand, it seems like a lot of people don't understand money creation in general. And obviously, you and Warren, two two people that have spent enormous amounts of time researching this and living this, uh, you know, ha have even a different understanding of, of of the money creation process. I mean, these clerics in the high towers have have made a good job of making it confusing for regular people, much less folks that spend forever studying it. I mean. What is, why do you suppose that is? Is this just about, uh, you know, keeping it as complex as possible to ensure well, that the proletariat <laughs> doesn't know what's going on? No, I think what you've got is a, is a fundamentally religious belief about the nature of capitalism, which was, uh, you can really read right back to Jean Baptiste Say, uh, back at the time of Ricardo, uh, arguing that capitalism is an inherently utility maximizing uh, full employment system. And as an essential part of that, say, abstracted from the existence of money. If you actually read what he called the Catechism of Political Economy, he said, we, are, we do not, uh, uh, people who sell a really demanding merchandise for their merchandise. Money plays no, no substantial role. And when you look at the neoclassical theory that really is a mathematical elaboration of, of uh, say's fantasies, uh, what that includes is the neutrality of money. Now, if you say money is not neutral, which is a major part of what MMT is talking about, then you pull the tiny piece of neoclassical edifice out. And it's such an intricate uh, belief system that any particular part falling apart call the entire thing to shatter. So they fight to hang on to that belief. And my, my favorite example of that right now is a paper by a couple of Swiss neoclassicals, a guy called Thor and Gerbach, I think, where they try to show that loanable funds and endogenous money are identical so long as you assume there's no risk therefore no uncertainty and therefore no bank defaults now if you're willing to assume that i can assume you'd like to buy a bridge off me it's just insanely bad but that's that they, they they are retreating from the real world and the major part of that retreat is not allowing the reality of money in what mnt is saying is that we have to understand the reality of money to understand a capitalist system capitalism is fundamentally monetary so I think that's the that's the strong point. That's the major reason that I, I overlap so much with MMT. My points where I don't overlap are twofold. One is that I think 
they haven't properly incorporated the role of the international sector. I'm going to continue disagreeing with Ryan. We're not going to reach a resolution in this discussion, obviously, on that particular point. But another part of it comes, we might actually talk more about this in a moment, is the tendency among some MMT uh, authors to argue that unemployment is caused by the government. Uh, on it's the basis good. that if you didn't have uh, the government uh, running uh, taxing too much, there'd be full employment. And I think that is a very, very fallacious and very dangerous way of expressing a wrong idea. All right, okay, well, back? Warren's back. And I, mm -hmm. what we wanted to do, uh, Steve yep. Keen just brought up the idea that um, his disagreement, one of the key disagreements is the role of government in uh, causing unemployment, et cetera. Okay. I, I should probably let Steve recap that so I don't put words in his mouth. Hey, hey, Steve, let, you, uh, let, me, uh, let me just wrap up the last one. Sure. Uh -huh. Whenever the state or the government buys something and doesn't tax, that's deficit spending. That's a net add to the economy and so uh, of, of net financial assets. And so when the European Central Bank, if they were to buy dollars, that would, you know, and pay with euro, that would be a net add of euro net financial assets, but they don't. Now, Bank of China does. It's, it's optional government policy. Germany used to do it. I think they had $50 billion before they joined the euro that they got from selling marks to buying euros. So trade per se doesn't change foreign exchange reserves. It doesn't change the net financial assets, the global net financial assets of that currency. It just transfers them from one owner to another. It well, transfers I, them from a non-resident to a resident or from a resident to a non-resident. But that's transfer from non-resident to resident. It's increasing money where the residents are, which is my point. Well, the money, again, the money stays in the same place. It's just the owner change of the account changes hands. I'm well, not saying it doesn't change. have consequences. I'm yeah. not saying it doesn't have consequences. Yeah. Well, okay, but from a monetary, okay, but from a monetary perspective, you know, the account goes from Joe at Citibank, you know, the dollar, you know, and if, if you got, if, you, if, if you're like, again, in the UK, buying a Mercedes from Germany, the pounds go from your account to Mercedes, and then they go from Mercedes account to whoever sells them the euro. And the euros goes from whoever sold them the euro to Mercedes on some bank, you know, on the books of some European bank. So you have... But I'm still seeing... The euro I'm account so, changes so, hands in Germany, Germany and the and pound the account changes hands in the UK. Yeah, but what I'm seeing happening is the euro account of Mercedes increases as a result of that and they can finance their right. investment with their trade right. service. But the, but and the account of, right, but the account of somebody in Germany, euro account went down. The total euro doesn't change. Yeah. It just transfers from one account to another. There's no net creation of euro. I would disagree. I, I, okay. I think, you know, again, I need to model this out, but I disagree. I think in that particular case, you would have the, the central bank being motivated to create more euros than it would do if it wasn't a trade surplus. Well, look, there's a big surplus look, now. Well, now. Europe is running a $300 billion a year surplus. And the ECB hasn't, you know, sold a single euro or bought a single dollar. They've just let it go. Yeah, but if you look, if you look at what's happening in Germany, and this is, again, the data I look at all the time, the declining level of both government and private debt there in Germany. Yeah. Uh, the way to explain that while Germany is still growing is so that it's growing courtesy of its trade surplus. Yeah, exactly. I agree, but it's because euros yeah, are being euros are being yep, transferred okay. from euros are being transferred from another private sector holder to German private sector holders. Yeah, well, that's my point. That's my point, and that's a creating money in that process. And it's, uh, it's I don't know if you. That's why it. I don't I don't see exports as you. Well, you have to your, 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 your comment you've made in your. Points that exports are a cost and imports are a benefit. Let's talk about yeah. that one. Yeah. So I, we're talking, it's in real terms, not in nominal terms. In real terms, look at the extreme. Let's say you export everything and don't import anything. What happens? I mean, everybody dies. You have no food, you have nothing. In, in our, okay. I, can give you, I can give you the same extreme in the other direction. And if everybody well, tries to import and nobody exports, nobody produces rather. No, no. Everybody in your country, just, just your country. So what if your country imports everything and doesn't have to export anything? You've got all the golf clubs, the tennis rackets. You're out having a good the food. You're out having a good time. Okay, you're, it's always. I see a lot of I see a lot of bored people in America voting for Trump. It's precisely that situation, and okay. it's a major hole to in the MMT argument. Yeah, I, I'm not saying it's psychologically. I'm just saying in real economic terms, in real terms. Look, if you win the war, if you win the war, the other guy sends stuff to you. You don't send stuff to him. 
you know, and that gives us that gave, that that's what that's what gave us uh, the Second World War. You know, the returns of the reparation with uh, with the Germany were not exactly a productive uh, outcome for the world. Well, that's exactly what the French wanted to do. I didn't say, I didn't say they were. I'm saying the exports mm. are the burden. It's a real cost to your economy. You build stuff and give it to somebody else. In imports, somebody else builds stuff and sends it to you. Now, you know, that's that that's the the statement about imports being real benefits and exports. I still, I still think that's I think that's too superficial. I think it's too clear. Because may, may I interrupt momentarily? I, I have a yeah. question. Let me just ask Steve. Steve, real terms of trade? You know, you try and get the most for the least, right? You do. Okay. And you try Why? At the same, at the Why? same time, if, if you're producing, yeah, okay, you try to get the best terms you can for what you're selling. True. But at the same time, you want to be manufacturing and growing. And if you are just simply, it, America can get away with it. You're talking about Warren and definitely because it produces the international reserve currency. You put yourself in a situation of a country like the UK, which is doing that, or Australia is doing it. The only way they can balance their current account by having a continuous deficit on the current account is a continuous surplus on the capital account, which means they're selling their assets to overseas overseas yeah. owners. Steve, and I'm over not, time, not, yeah, I'm not that saying is, that, that, is, that, is a, that is a bigger loss than exports. Yeah, I, I'm not saying they're not, but uh, number one, when you know somebody buys a apartment in London, they don't dig it up and take it home. Okay, but the, and number two, look at India. I mean, India has been running a current account deficit and trade deficit for what, 25 or 30? All these, what, what it is, is this, if the other guy, if they're your counterparty, has a desire to net save in your currency, he's got to earn that currency by giving you real goods and services. And just that simple act per se is a real benefit to you and a, and a real cost to him. The work and a real cost to you as well, because if you're then running a permanent deficit on that basis, you then have to have a current account, capital account surplus, which means you're selling your assets over time. Okay, but and that's, that's a, the situation. That, that's the Australian that's economy. That's where I come from. We've, we've had 50 years of running a current account deficit, mainly, with a capital yeah. account surplus, meaning, therefore, we don't have any – well, you have some domestic capitalists these days, but the vast – a large part of the capital income of Australia goes to America – and the rest of the world, Japan, China, you name it, because yeah. we don't own the assets anymore. Okay, so, so number that is one, a major cost to a country over time. And that's number not one, taken that, into account by that argument. Those are nom number one. They're nominal costs, and and, you know, and what at the end of the day, what your standard of living is based on is your real terms of trade. And you're telling me about the nominal costs, which I agree with that. I'm not disagreeing with that. There are nominal costs. It's not nominal costs. It's ownership of your assets. If you're the, if you if that's you nominal. Are, no, it's not a nothing nominal about earning assets. If the, the if you have if the if seventy percent of your country is owned by another country, yeah, then seventy percent of your profit flow is going to be going overseas rather than saying domestically to get reinvested. Yeah, but why and does that matter? Problem. Why does that matter if they're not spending the money? If they don't even follow the question. Okay, so if you've got capital, let's say Australia is paying seventy-seven billion dollars of us of Australian dollars in rent to Germany or China. And they don't spend any of it. They just pile it up as reserves. Then Australia doesn't have to export anything to them, and there's no real cost to Australia. It's just a nominal well, Australia, cost. The cost is 70% of its profits go overseas and don't, don't remain, behind, remain yeah. behind for domestic investment. So your economy grows more slowly. You no, 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 this, no, 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 no. Rapidly. No, domestic investment is not constrained by th that. That's not a constraint on domestic investment. I totally disagree. Well, loans create deposits. The government can net spend. There's no constraint on available funding. If there's, if you're having, well, the loans create deposits are creating asset bubbles in the real estate sectors rather than creating actual investment. The government's not is running a, a small deficit trying to control it, which is possibly both now is totally wrong. But the firms themselves have right. There's very little investment funds being held domestically. You are not investing domestically. And growing in domestic capabilities, and like Australia just shut down its, manu its car industry completely recently, and right. yeah, well, just a huge part. Uh, it's just not investing, and it's because it's running a trade deficit over time. Yeah, I, I I agree that policy response can turn a good thing into a bad thing, and that's what Australia's done. They've turned a, a good thing, a trade deficit, into a bad thing with their policy response, of tight fiscal, and the whole. Well, thing. Look, at this, on this particular point, I'm going to go to another authority called John Maynard. Okay. And one thing he was also very strong about was the need to restrain the growth of large trade deficits. He wanted to have pressure on surplus countries to spend. He wanted to have deficit countries required to devalue, et cetera, et cetera. Frankly, I think in this particular case, I'm backing John Maynard and opposing MMT. Yeah, and I, don't I, 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 say say I don't think I should be able to say that. I don't think I should say that. I would say that. 
I would say that's entirely applicable to fixed exchange rate policy, where the imperative is to sustain, you know, your reserves and your exchange rate. But without that, with the floating no. exchange rate, it's not applicable. No, well, the floating exchange rate was supposed to get rid of current account deficits. You remember the neoclassical idea? No, 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 no. It gets rid of the constraint. It doesn't get rid of the deficit. It turns people believe. The, the, the people believe. Not, I'm talking your belief. Not talking your belief here, Warren. But the, the, the Milton Friedmans of the world and so on, who are arguing for uh, floating exchange rates as well, argue that that would mean well, price mechanism would solve the deficits. Would have the exchange rates would adjust, and that every country would reach a, a yeah. trade balance. Yeah. It's totally mythological. Okay, yeah. we've now seen Japan maintaining 40 or 50 years of trade surpluses. Yeah, a country like Australia maintaining trade deficits. I, yeah, would I, happily, I would happily compare the industrialization of Japan to the industrialization of Australia and the point I'm making here. Yeah, I, look, I, I agree that the, you know, Friedman was wrong. What can I tell you? <laughs> but that's a different point from what I'm making. Well, again, I think that's one point where MMT has got it wrong. What part do I have wrong? The part of it wrong is that you, if you have a, if you're earning a current account deficit, you must have a capital account surplus. Right. No, I, exactly I say that. Not, I, we know wait, that. Wait, okay. wait a minute. One at a time. So I have that right because I, I understand that yeah. identity. Okay. Now what I'm saying is that that's capital account surplus means over time the ownership of your assets, your productive assets, is going from domestic hands to foreign hands. Not necessarily. That's not necessarily equity. They can buy equity anyway, whether you have a current account surplus or deficit. Yeah, but what they, it means you're required to sell the equity or required to sell debt. All right. In the first which, order, which, in the first instance, now you're not required to. You're spending the money first and then buying. Look, in the first instance, they're holding treasury securities, right? There's three or four trillion of U.S. treasury securities out there. There's no equity. And the same with Australia. They're holding Australian government bonds and, you know, Indian and the whole thing. Now, if people want to buy equity or not, that's fine. But generally, states don't buy equity. You know, Swiss, no, but, Swiss national banks different, but most states don't buy equity. Yeah, but so what I'm talking about so is they're not buying your cash. There's no they're, capital. There's no real. What capital. they're buying is your companies. They're, 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 they're well, the states, the states are not buying your company. No, no, no. But if not the corporate American corporations are buying Australian companies. Right, and we're running okay. a trade deficit, a current account deficit, and we're buying your companies. I'm just saying it's not a constraint. It's a constraint for us because we get less investment funds back in this country. Oh, than we'd have no, no, we're not. Our and. If Australia is running a trade deficit, but you have Australians buying companies all over the world, having a trade deficit doesn't constrain your corporations from it buying doesn't corporations. Stop some of them doing it, but in the aggregate, the overall effect is you're selling your domestically owned assets to foreign foreign nationals who are not financial investing. Financial assets, financial assets. Which means they've got ownership of the real ones, financial no, assets. No, no, no. Not, it's not equity. It's mostly debt. But it could be equity. I'm not saying it couldn't be. A huge but, part of the Australian is foreign, is foreign equity. There's a huge number of Australian companies which are 100% foreign owned. Yeah. General but, Motors okay. lost one of them until it's closed down. Okay. Right. And the, and the only, look, that's important for two reasons. Number one, control. You might not want foreigners controlling things. Okay. But apart from that, it's only important because they could get the profits and then spend them in your country, you know, driving exports, which are real costs. The way you pay back importing for a lot of years is to export for a lot of years, you know, worst case if that happens. But well, when the time comes, when that time comes, there's a lot of domestic policies you could do, so it won't ever happen. You know, you've got people sending you real goods and services in exchange for credit balances at your central bank, and there's no guarantee or no promise or nothing that says those credit balances are ever going to be able to buy things they can take home. They're sending it in return for owners for financial claims on your assets. Okay, we're talking financial transactions. Well, they're buying Australian dollars and they're buying Australian government bonds. It's not a claim on And they're buying life. Australian companies. Fine, but they can do that anyway. That, they don't, that has nothing to do with the trades. I think it has a major factor. Why, if you're running a deficit, you're in that situation. But there's not very, there aren't many Japanese uh, Japanese companies owned by American corporations or any corporate any other country in the world for that matter. The country that run a trade surplus and that they've a current account, they, they can actually invest in the rest of the world in the aggregate. And they are not the ones whose assets, domestic assets, are owned by foreigners. Sure. Look, what, look at all the foreign assets Australians own in the UK they own, in the United States. Uh, uh, in in India, is negative, that? massively negative. You can point to individual instances. That's like, you know, anecdotes versus statistics. Uh, but in the aggregate level, we have lost a large amount of our ownership of, overseas, of our domestic assets, and a large part of our profit flow goes overseas. Yeah. And what's, okay. I'm talking about Chris Christian Riley's comment here. What's the, what's, the, what's the real cost of that? If it's not, it's you mean the only you real have cost. less investment. You have less investment. No, the real cost Basic would be investment. 
the real cost would be your real terms of trade. That's the only, nice. look, the whole point of economics is consumption, right? There's no point in building anything or doing anything if you're not going to consume it. It's just a waste of time. Unless it's artwork, well, you consume that. It's just a waste of time. So you I look at real terms. About developing, it's huh? also about developing capabilities over time. About what? It's not just developing capabilities over time, which takes investment. Okay, but Improving that's, the technology over time. To, if we're, what, to, to what further purpose except consumption? You're just talking about long-term consumption versus short-term consumption. I'm talking about the, having the capacity of a particular country to produce on a broad scale. And if you are running trade deficits as Australia is doing, we are running out of the capacity to produce on a broad scale. Now, a country that has that you know, trade surfaces, has its own manufacturing sector, owns its own industries, that right. country grows more sufficiently. All right, so what happens when you run out of assets? What, what, what's that day of reckoning look like? Now, I'm not saying you are, but let's say you do. That's a long way in the future. But what it means is you have, you what's basically, that? all you, you, have, you have a country consisting only of workers, all the capitalists are foreigners. Let's say you sold, let's say you sold the uh, opera house to, you know, China. What, what are they going to do? Dig it up and take it home? I mean, the same people are going to go see it. Are they going to have to pay more for a ticket? Like the guys there now, is, you know, could have charged I think the income, the income distribution <laughs> in the country and the income levels in the country would fall compared to what it would be if you actually risk exporting. We don't have. Why, why would it fall? What you're saying is, you're saying you have a country of consisting entirely of workers and no capitalists. That to me is a poor country. Not necessarily. I mean, it could be. I'm not saying it what. What? I'm oh, sorry. This is this is the right room for an argument on this particular point. Uh, maybe we should move on to the next topic. All right. All right. But you know, I'm just saying, first order per se, exports are real cost that you pay the you. Know, it's your work and somebody else gets what you, the fruits of your labor and imports are real benefits. And yes, there's a nominal payment, uh, a dollar balance transfers from a domestic account to a foreign, to a, it stays as a domestic asset, but it transfers so, from a domestic I mean, owner to a foreign owner. What you're saying is, what you're saying is Japan's followed a very foolish strategy for the last 50 years. They what? Until I did not. It's effectively saying Japan's followed a very foolish strategy for the last 30 or 40 years, and so is Korea, and so is Germany. Oh I'm yeah. Sorry that. Yeah, you know, to me it I looks like what, I, it, To me it looks like what would happen if you were forced to do war reparations? You'd send the U.S. two million cars a year. You'd send Australia however many cars a year you get, and get nothing in return. That's called war reparations. Well, if I look at which country, if I look at Chicago versus Hiroshima. Yeah. How do you guess which country was bombed in the Second World War? I'd say it was America. Yeah, because of our domestic policy. You know, our deficit's too small. We're not making the domestic investments. We have unused capacity. You know, I think you're also running far too large a trade deficit because you made the mistake of being the reserve currency rather than the bank or being created in the first place. And this, that, that failure to... You don't think the U.S. could... You don't think the U.S. could rebuild all its infrastructure independent of trade? No, I don't think it certainly it could, but it's not doing right. it. Right. Well, that's a total failure that's of policy in recognizing that, you know, everything else about MMT, right? That's got nothing to do with trade. I think it's got a lot to do with trade, and trade is part of MMT, and I don't believe you can do that properly, and we're not going to do it either of us on that particular point, so let's move on to one of the others. Can, okay. can, I, can I jump in here just for a second? Sure. You guys are going toe-to-toe -to -toe here, and, and it's 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 extremely important discussion. I think there's a lot of people out there that have – a lot of questions, but but the one question I have, and it's really confusing to me because obviously I look at Europe largely as the United States, like Florida and Chicago and New York and California, whatever. You're talking about Germany, which is not monetarily sovereign. They've given up their sovereignty to the ECB. They are now part of a state system like the United States has. Yeah, and yeah. we're we're talking about a two different, it feels like two entirely different scenarios. So I'm having a real difficult time wrapping my head around that. Germany can't produce euros just because they have to go and, and literally borrow from a an, an extra non-governmental situation that has nothing to do with their country now. Whereas yeah, the United it, States does have its own national bank, just like uh, the UK, Australia, China, Russia, and, and Japan, obviously. So what, what, what I'm hearing is it sounds to me like if Texas is a net importer or a net exporter versus whether Florida is a net importer or a net exporter, I'm, I'm seeing this 
in different terms. Can you please show me where I'm right or wrong in this? Because I, I, I'm not, I, I see Europe as a very different scenario than I do the UK or oh, Canada. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. I, 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 I'm just using Europe because that's, that's where I am based at the moment. But you're better off making an analogy between, say, Japan and, and Australia and leaving out uh, America, which is the reserve currency producer, or the European Union, which has a single currency strangling the continent. Well, uh, Steve, you just use the European Union as a whole. It's running a 300 right. billion trade surplus. Yeah, yeah, that's it's running a huge trade surplus. And you know, yes, most of it's Germany, but it's still a huge trade surplus. Yeah, that's true. Overall. Yeah. And if you look at consumption, it's down by the trade surplus. That that had been domestic output. If they just kept it for themselves, you know, they'd be that much better off. But of course, they can't do it within their fiscal constraints. So, so you know. let, let me ask you. But this you're right, Steve, Steve. You're correct. But look, exports are costs, and imports are benefits for any agent. For your family, things you have to send out as a cost, things you get in as a benefit. Your work is your cost. Well, maybe maybe a particular point. I, I normally I normally criticise a lot of American reports as being rather puritanical in basis, but I sort of have a puritanical side here as well, and saying you need the discipline of working. And uh, I don't like the idea of saying I sit back on my ass and hand up pieces of paper and get uh, commodities back for them. I think I should be working for them That's to some fine. degree. And, and that working makes me stronger. No, none, nonetheless, economics is the opposite of religion. It's better to receive than to give, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let, let me let me let me jump in here one more time. So we, we have a bunch of great conversation there, but there's a yeah. couple points though that I think are are really key. And one of them that I've seen debated around, and you know, a, a full disclosure. So there's no concern. I, I, you know, obviously, I'm very very much a, an advocate for the federal job guarantee and for job guarantee programs in general from sovereign mm -hmm. states. I understand that there's some concern and some discussion about the United States in particular, but other countries as a whole that government creates unemployment. And we're saying the dollar, you know, MNT would say the dollar is merely a tax credit and that the imposition of a tax creates the first unemployed person. And therefore, you know, you have to work to get that dollar. So as a public option, there should be a job waiting for you so that we keep the production high and we peg the uh, economy to labor. The almost. flip side is almost. this UBI, uh, go ahead. Uh, almost, but go ahead. Well, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just Steve Dude. I'm the, uh, I'm the activist, yeah, yeah. not the economist. <laughs> yeah. but, but with that in mind, what I, the UBI, on the other hand, is something that I've seen folks like Roger Malcolm Mitchell and I've seen uh, Professor Keene and others uh, be more sympathetic towards. What I'm trying to understand is the real relationship between UBI versus job guarantee, why one is superior of the other, whether they can be combined, and more importantly, if in fact government is responsible for unemployment. Go. <laughs> okay. So uh. you had started when I interrupted you, so you want to just go ahead? Me? Oh. Uh, okay, well, look, I'll let you start on the job guarantee, Warren. It's more your, your thing, okay. and uh, I'll come with my nuances on it. All right, so for me, the money story always starts with a government that wants to provision itself. And there, historically, there are different ways to do this. You could go take, you know, win a war and bring back slaves or something like that. Or you could hit drunks on the head with a beer bottle and they wake up on the, in the British Navy. There's different ways to provision government. Uh, but we've all... For the main part, we use a monetary system. And so let's look at that, you know, clean sheet of paper. How do we do that? How's, how does the government provision itself? And the, the example I like to use is uh, when the British went into Ghana in the early uh, 1800s. Um, and this is a story I've read, whether it's true or not actually doesn't matter because it makes a point anyway, but I, I believe it is true. Uh, they wanted to grow coffee. And there were the people who were already living there had no interest in growing coffee for the British. They were hunting and fishing and taking care of the kids and the grandmothers were taking care of. They didn't have, they didn't have any unemployment as we define it, people looking for paid work. So the British could offer them money to go grow coffee, but they didn't have any interest. It didn't, had no value to them in that society. Uh, so what the British did was they put a tax on their houses, their huts. They called it a hut tax. And, and it was in some script called the crown or something. And you either paid the tax, and maybe it's 10 crown a month per hut, or they would burn your house down. And now all of a sudden you've got 
the place got monetized. Now they're all looking for work down at the coffee plantation. How much do you pay? Oh, we pay one crown a day. And they would get 10 days labor out of each hut. And then when people who were, you know, growing tomatoes wanted to sell them, they wanted crowns so they could pay their hut tax without um, getting their house burned down. And so somebody would go work extra days to get tomatoes because he doesn't like farming. And the whole economy immediately gets monetized. And then what we see is that a certain, so people would, there'd be a certain tax. If there are 100 huts and there was 10 crown each, the total tax would be 1,000. But at the end of the day, the British would spend more than 1,000 crown. They, okay, number one, they had to spend first before they could collect tax, right? You spend first and then collect the tax because there's no other place to get it. So people would show up for work and invariably more than enough would show up. So they might get 1,100 days labor and they would, so they'd spend 1,100 and only collect 1,000 and the other 10 would be, uh, the other 100 would be savings, uh, currency and circulation, the money supply of the village. And okay, so th the question is what would happen if they taxed 1,000 but, and they only wanted maybe 1,100 days work but there were 1,500 people showed up for work because there was a huge desire to save these things. Okay, now you have unemployment, all right? And let me just back up a second. As soon as they put the tax on everybody's hut, a place that never had any unemployment now had mass unemployment because suddenly everybody was looking for paid work to pay to earn the crown so they didn't get their house burned down. After the British employed as many as they wanted, if they didn't take everybody who wanted the paid work, they had residual unemployment, which meant the, the desire to save was that much higher. And then the British had two choices. They could either lower the tax or hire the rest of the people. Okay. Uh, and so we're in much the same position today. The, the tax structure of the U.S. economy produces maybe 15 million unemployed. Maybe the government hires 10 million. I don't know the exact numbers. I mean, it hires 5 million. And then we have 10 million residual unemployed. It, it means the tax was too powerful. <laughs> it created a huge savings desire. Of course, we also put laws in place. So uh, you get all these pre-tax savings plans, uh, tax deductions for your IRAs and your KOs and your pension fund and your medical expense, all kinds of things. So we've given, we put in these powerful incentives to not spend income and it all grows tax-free, all that income's unspent. And so a relatively small tax produces a whole lot of unemployed that the government doesn't want to hire. And so the obvious response is to either hire them, increase public spending or lower the tax and let them go back into the private sector. The problem is once they're unemployed, they become damaged goods. Not personally, but in that the private sector doesn't like to hire people who haven't been working. So what we do is we provide a transition job, a job guarantee that says anybody willing and able to work can have a job for it. If the number doesn't matter economically, it's going to be a numeraire anyway, but I'll pick a number of $10 an hour. And I know that I get arguments over that, but it doesn't, I can also show how it doesn't matter long-term. And it can be changed the next day if it's a bad thing. It's not a thousand year wage or anything. So before everybody gets too upset and says it should be 15 or whatever. Okay, you pay $10 an hour and um, for anybody who wants a job. Now those people who take that job will then uh, presumably uh, be able to transition more easily back into the private sector with sufficient fiscal adjustment, lower taxes or more public spending than they would have been if they were unemployed. And all the statistics show that, and the Fed New York just came out with a study showing exactly that, that employers prefer to hire the, the employed and not the unemployed. And so the whole, to me, the primary purpose is to undo what the government did, which was overtaxed for the number of people it wanted. And maybe you have to do that to get the quality you want. And then you have to transition people back. And maybe some of these people will never transition back. I understand that, but it, it, it's part of the program. And then if you look at currencies, every currency, the, the price level of every currency is ultimately controlled by some kind of buffer stock policy. Right now, of course, we use an unemployed buffer stock, which is not particularly effective. The hysteresis is showing the each time you takes more and more unemployment to, uh, you know, the, the Nehru or whatever you want to call it. And I, not that there is a Nehru, but the mythical Nehru keeps going up and up, right? Uh, because the private sector doesn't like to hire the unemployed, they become damaged goods. Now, once you're in a transition job, then you can, it's just a much more 
the, the population becomes a much more liquid buffer stock. The, the employed are much more liquid in terms of being hireable, being employable than the unemployed. And so it becomes a superior price anchor to using unemployment. And they certainly aren't less liquid. So it's in all likelihood, they're more liquid, they're certainly not less liquid. So what we have is a, uh, a form of full employment and we have a superior price anchor. And, and that's the nature of it. Now, I know there's a lot of people who, who have all these grand ideas for what these employ these people should do, and that's fine. But for me, that they should be hired as regular public sector employees. If you think you want people out doing green jobs and doing these things for the public sector, don't use the JG to do that, just hire them, okay? Or if they're in the JG for a while and now you've decided they're doing useful things by being crossing guards for children, hire them as public sector workers, okay? And so uh, I don't know if that difference makes me more or less progressive. I think it makes me more progressive. I'm not sure, but uh, that's that's my personal opinion on that. And sorry to talk so long on that. That's okay. So Professor Keene, your your turn here, sir. Well, actually, on the job guarantee, I'm not a not a critic of the job guarantee. Uh, what I my my perspective. We'll talk about what causes unemployment at a later point. But in terms of the role of things like a job guarantee versus universal basic income, uh, I have, uh, first of all, a um, you know, support for the idea of a job guarantee for the reason that, that, that um, Warren's outlined. Uh, I have two concerns about it as the only policy. I know a lot of people say job guarantee versus UBI. I don't see why it has to be versus. I think you could potentially have a UBI at a lower level than an automated that gave you a job guarantee, oh. which is at a lower level that gave you a private sector or a public sector job. And you could, you know, you wouldn't be uh, a. Steve, I completely automated. agree. I completely yeah, agree. Great. Yeah, yeah, that's great, Mike, to hear that. And, and now, I, I might have a different reason, but I agree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what that, what that, there's a few things about it. I mean, for the job guarantee, a um, good mate of mine, David Grover, is coming out with a book. I think I'm actually already published called Bullshit Jobs. And if you look at the type of jobs a lot of people are doing, even in the more modern economy, even if they're very, very close to full employment, a lot of what people are doing is just bullshit and they know it. And yeah. this is partly because over time, our technological level has risen so much, that the number of people we need to actually be doing physical production of physical goods and services is trivial. It's down to something of the order of between, you know, depending on the economy, 10 and 20% of the population having yeah. any real direct role in manufacturing. And as yeah, time Steve, goes on- Steve, the, yeah. people worry, the people worried about the robots, they're already here for 90%. We're just talking about yeah, tag right. now. Yeah. That's right. They're right. confusing a productivity story with an unemployment story. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. And but the other thing about it, as time goes on, um, this is now I want to have workers versus capitalist story here. Because yeah. I, my argument, the reason why workers get paid a wage is because they can say to a capitalist, unless you pay me enough to live, I'm not going to flick that switch. You've got to flick yeah. it yourself. Okay. These days, workers do not get a job because they're productive. They get a job because they're required to turn the machines on. Now, if you get to the point where the machines can turn the machines on, then that particular capacity for workers, which is the vast majority of the population, to blackmail the capitalists to give them a share of the surplus the system is generating disappears. And I think politically, we have to get to the point where the mass of the population is organized not through its capacity to bargain over having a job and those jobs being necessary for capitalists to make a profit, but I want them to be able to get it as a part of the, 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 poly, the polis of the society. And therefore, that society provides a basic living for everybody, which would be the universal basic way, basic income. Uh, if you want to work, then uh, you want to try to get a much larger income, then you can do that. And you can also be an entrepreneur, which is something I'm massively in favour of. Genuine entrepreneurs, not our yeah. not our property market mob. mob. But ultimately, this was technology gets more and more advanced, more and more work is done by machines, less and less need for labour. We're going to need to change that power structure and getting a UBI now, I think is part of doing that. Um, okay, I so understand a lot, of, a lot of American resistance to that is because a lot of the uh, people are pushing UBI, want to basically use it to eliminate all of the forms of welfare and actually reduce the amount the state is paying. And of course, I don't support that. I want to see UBI being right. a decent basic income, decent living standard. Okay, so let's go back to Ghana where you charge $10, a 10 crown, you know, a month rent. Then you say, you know what, we'll give you a universal basic income of 10 crowns. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to show up for work. If, if governments can't provision itself, it can't grow coffee. 
Okay. My point is that you're getting that 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 is the, you're taking back to the 19th century. I take it forward to the 22nd. Um, if yeah. we improve our technology over time, there'll be no need for virtually no need for labour whatsoever. We've already both agreed that about 90 percent of workers aren't involved in the production at the yeah. moment. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be 99 percent at some stage. Now, yeah, and I think that's a small uh, jump. You know, I think the bulk of it's already happened. Yeah, it's always it's a bit further to go, and I think ultimately, for the sake of the planet, we've got to protect this. Is going to think we're going to let the space get it, and I'm right, happy right, to right. do some advice in Amsterdam. Uh, we're going to need to take, take production off planet to, to repair the damage we've done to the ecology of this planet at some point. Yeah, yeah. And when we do that, you certainly can't talk about putting any you know, percentage of the population in space. Uh, it is going to be a case where the owners of the machinery are the ones who are going to get the benefits, unless we impose some social social control that means the massive population receives a, a living income. And yeah. my fear is if we don't get this politically worked out ahead of schedule early enough, then we're going to face what I call the Hunger Games future. With the vast majority get bugger all, they're entertained, they're, they're repressed, and a tiny elite that's extremely well on the wealth created by the machinery and the technology we've embedded. And I think we're, we're within 50 to 100 years of that period hitting. Yeah, well, the, 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 the job guarantee, the transition job, can be it's a wage set by the government so it can be a real wage you know it can, yeah, it can yeah. set a minimum standard of living and so if you direct a minimum number of real resources from the bottom up then the top is fighting for a lip they can have all the nominal wealth they want but they're fighting for a limited amount of real wealth and they can't outbid the state <laughs> there is no such thing and so yeah, to me that addresses own, that problem the trouble is they can own the state this is the world exactly, we have in yeah, the future. That, which is which is my campaign finance reform, which is critical. Yeah. Which is you can give all the money you want, except 40% goes to the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> can, can I jump in momentarily? I, I, one of the things yeah. that I'm noticing, because I, as somebody who's on the learning side versus the teaching yeah. side, I, you know, it jumps out at me that w what we're really talking about a lot of times is placing more emphasis on these artificial rules fiscal rules and, and things like that, that prevent certain things as if they were spoken into existence from God from day one, and they exist in perpetuity. When in reality is we see things like the silly debt ceiling in the United States, mm -hmm. that is obviously a man-made construct that doesn't really serve any purpose other than to create another political hoop to jump through. Um, I, I think that we're, we're I'm seeing some difference Oh, hey, we've lost our bloody commentator here. How about that? I'm back. back again. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, I, I, I'm good. I just had to plug my phone in. Uh, down we the just, we just lost Steve for a moment there. That was really, really critical. That was strange. The ref, the ref was out of the gym. Out of the, <laughs> so, out of the back to, to, to the question, though. W we, why are we placing so much emphasis? And now Warren's gone. Why are oh, we God. placing so Here, let's bring him back. So, I'm the only consistent people in Amsterdam. It's, it's, it's about it seems like we keep placing more emphasis on fiscal rules as if they're real constraints as opposed to artificial ones. Yeah. Then, then just understanding Is that. Steve, are you there? I'm here. We're all here. Can you hear yeah. us? Can Steve? you hear us, Warren? Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Well, it, the the point I'm making here is is that yeah. the Warren, we're going to drop you off real quick, buddy. the The idea yeah. here is is that fiscal rules and monetary policy kind of get conflated sometimes. And and what yeah. I'm seeing here is the need to serve the people. Like, and I'm going to stay U.S. centric momentarily, just because it's a place of uh, familiarity. I'm going to bring Warren back up. I think he's found his spot. Huh? That's right. Okay. See. Warren, can you hear us okay? Yeah, you know, I didn't hear the last three or four minutes. Yeah, good. Okay, that's right. Good. Yep. So, what, what I'm oh, saying oh, is oh, just to bring us all back to the point there's a lot of emphasis on fiscal rules. There's an incredible amount yeah. of, of emphasis on these gold standard based, peg commodity based type rules. You know that that really have no applicability in a non peg non you know a fiat currency environment, and yet right. we live by them as if they're God spoken. Yeah. What it seems like you guys agree on an awful lot, but there are some things that I'm I'm feeling just in my plebe status 
that yeah. m- maybe maybe I'm I'm picking up on some some things that maybe are emphasizing fiscal rules over p- perhaps the the real base of a fiat currency. Not keep me honest here. I don't want to over speak my hand because I. I'm truly the moderator. Well, I, mean, I, think might, I, I think I've got an idea of what you're thinking. I guess why Roy and I, I think we're totally on the same page. And that is that people have an understanding of the role of money, similar to the understanding that the Ptolemaic astronomers had of the uh, solar system. And they say, look, it must be the case that the Earth is the center of the universe because look, the sun and the moon and the planet all orbit us. And we're saying, no, it's not the case. It's actually the Earth is spinning as it rotates around the sun. And that makes you the illusion of appearing the sun rises and sun sets. Uh, but you've really got that mental flip people have to go through to understand the actual role of money. Warren and I, the Lehman Fee crowd in general, and most post Keynesians are on the other side of that uh, that gestalt flip. But the majority of the population, and certainly the majority of politicians and journalists, are still on the toll make side of economics. And what I've been trying to do, and Warren, I'd like you to take a look at this, by the way, actually, my, my Minsky software. I've been yeah. designing that to try to find a framework where those people actually look at these flows with actual numbers on them. Hypothetical numbers, obviously, in the hypothetical model of the economy. But one thing I did there, and I've done this, would you believe the, the English government, I've got this, I took out the English, a bunch of incompetent noms. Uh, I, wrote, I wrote two submissions, to two parliamentary inquiries, and they lost them both. And then said it must be my difficulty in uploading the fucking submissions, pardon the French. And I sent them my receipt of, thank you for sending your submission to us. Document. Yeah. What, what, but one, th- one thing I did with that is I, I did a little model of, of the economy, I thought they called me Tom, Dick, Harry, uh, Tom, Dick and Harry, uh, each with $100 in their account, each spending $100 per year on each other, and they then each decide to save money. And so Tom dispenses has been $10 less on each of, uh, uh, $5 less on each of, of Dick and Harry. And what happens is he saved $10 that year, but he's spending $5 less on each of the other two. But the other two have minus five in savings because the whole thing balances out to zero and yeah. GDP falls by precisely the amount of money that's saved. Yeah. And try to make this case that if you try to save money, what you're actually doing is reducing GDP by precisely the amount you're saving. Yeah. And the whole idea of saving has to be driven, I think, driven out of people's thinking. Uh, yeah. But what they think is they're yeah. saving for a rainy day or they're saving, like they're saving acorns or, you yeah. know, as my good friend Michael uh, Kumok puts it, they're saving gravel. Uh, to, yeah. to use at a later stage. So I'd like you to look at that Minsky software and have a play with it because this is yeah. a major way of providing a way that we can actually get their heads around this, which means they can say, oh, it's actually, you're right. The sun is actually, it's staying still. So in fact, we're spinning. Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. Paradox of thrift, right? <laughs> Effectively, yeah. And I, I can actually demonstrate it mathematically and say, okay, you try to save money here and see what happens. Oh dear, the GDP fell. And wow. it, it does make that point very, very visual and very effective. I, I just look at the extreme. What if everybody spent nothing? Yeah, yeah, bang, GDP is zero. No sales, yeah. no jobs, no income, no savings. Yeah, right. yeah, fantastic. Because yeah. to fortune, we're all dead. Yeah, yeah. It, now, and that, was, that. That, was, that was first put forth in the late 1500s. <laughs> so it's not even a new theory. <laughs> no, no, I know. Yeah, I didn't know it was that far back. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we need to get that understanding forward. And the only way to really do it, I think, is that's a dynamic vision of an economy. And that's why I built Minsky as a dynamic modeling tool. So you can okay. actually say, you, here you have play with this, do, do what you think is a good idea and see what happens. Yeah. And the result is the opposite of what you expect. Yeah. And then you, then you say, once with this, this actually seems to the saving, this saving stuff, which is part of MMT uh, ling, lingo. And I'd like, to, I'd, I'd like to suggest we move away from it because I think it's actually destructively heard by the people who think yeah. in terms of savings in the old fashioned acorn fashion. We talk so, about the, the net desire to acquire net financial assets. Yeah. Um, so let me yeah. Let me just quickly yeah. come back to the universal basic income. So what yeah. I started before the example is that it threatens the government's ability to provision itself. The government but needs but to before, be, before you go too far, Stephanie's popped in saying, have Warren explain how it's structured you buy alongside job job guarantee. You can even know that let's yeah. see if it's okay. a good point. Hi Stephanie. So look, the the problem is if everybody gets the money they need to pay taxes for free, then there's nobody left to work for the government. The government can't spend its tax credit if there's no net tax out there. And so that, I'm not saying you'll get there immediately or anything, but that's a risk. And that's a pretty serious risk uh, because the whole point is the monetary system is in the first instance for the government to provision itself. And so um, the, on the other hand, our tax structure is so skewed against uh, the average person so regressive that uh, the basic income 
moves in the right direction to undo some of that regressiveness. Yeah, and so, I think that's true. So, so you can do it to some degree. You know, you might not be able to go to a full living wage without threatening provision, but you can certainly go to enough to undo a lot of the damage of our regressive tax system, or you can directly change the regressive tax system and sort of get to the same place. Uh, yeah. you know, so, so that's, 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 that's the way I'm looking at it. So from a practical yeah, point of view, the tax structure is so impossible to touch that it makes the, the basic income makes up for a lot of wrongs. I was actually feeling sympathy pains for the broken arm Stephanie out there. It just said, she, you must tell us how you, well, don't tell us how you did it until it's a, until it's a parlor joke, Stephanie, because did I, I saw the tweet about your breaking arm and great deal of sympathy for that situation. Yeah. Steve, well, have we completely lost the conversation here or what have we done? I think I'm still here. You guys are still here. You guys, if I just yeah, yeah. mute myself to minimize the uh, <laughs> feedback. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. So we, we are we are over time, but one thing I wanted to ask to close out: Is it fair to say that both of you believe in robust domestic spending to serve the people? Is that a fair statement that both both economists here would would yeah. support robust spending yeah. on the economy and for the people? Yeah. What we, what, we, what we need to do is to communicate that effectively to the public to think that's a bad thing. And the difficulty there is saying you, you have to really look at the flows and explain the flows and the accumulation of stocks in the system and show that if you try to do what people think is a good idea, you're actually taking money out of circulation and telling the economy to grow at a nominal time since at the same time. And it's that realisation, it's exactly the same best talk that people had to make from seeing the world in a Ptolemaic way to seeing it in a Copernican way. And, uh, you know, well, I think my hat off to the MMT in general for making a lot of this start to week through, but we've still got a long, long way to go. Okay, Steve, so I'll give you the micro and the macro. At the macro, we probably need it for now anyway to get to anywhere. You know, if we ran a $2 trillion deficit instead of a $1 trillion, we'd probably be, uh, you know, the gains in output would probably be 5 to 6% a year for a couple of years until we got to some not something closer to full utilization of capacity, but it can all be done in the wrong way. It can all be done in with and turn into like you know adding to our energy consumption of things we don't want to burn. It can be done by increasing the, it can be increasing the military that we don't want to do. Yeah. Okay, there are all kinds of wrong ways to do that. So it's not just spending per se. And also we've got some massively regressive taxation like the FICA taxes, which just punishing tax on people doing the real work. You know, making under a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, from you know, from zero on up. Who, without them, we'd have nothing. Everything you do, everything you have, every service you engage in is, you know, they're supporting it, and they're the most heavily taxed. So that, it, and all because they don't count FICA as a, they don't count the FICA tax as a tax. They say, oh, it's mm -hmm. an investment. It's not an investment. It's a tax. All right. So we've mm -hmm. got we've got regressive taxation to deal with. We've got um, uh, lack of our infrastructure needs probably a trillion a year for 10 years or something, you know, because we have the, it could be that much better, not because we're just throwing money at it, but we don't have the interface between government and the population is so bad that the population doesn't think the government can do anything right. We, we've got to address the interface between government and population, start off by giving everybody in government some kind of hospitality training, and then listen to what the public, you know, administration graduates tell you about nepotism and, and, and supervisory positions and how it undermines your departments and, and get it right. If we can't get that right, the government's going to have to be in a position to write the checks for these things, but it can't do it. And then our contracting structure is horrible also. It, you know, well, if I can, if it, my, my concluding remark is I think yeah. we've got to get the financial sector the role of the demon rather than the government. And the great trouble of the Austrian perspective on the economy and mainstream economy as well, they make uh, they, they make the workers or the government out to be the problem. I think the real problem in capitalism is it has one is the financial sector, and yeah, it's uh, yeah. excessive claims upon the realm economy and its its generation of parasitic claims and and speculation right. driving up asset prices rather than creating new yeah. assets. So that's yeah. that's so, the enemy we need to focus upon. Right. So uh, you know the financial sector is thirty percent of S and P profits or something. It, mm. When I was in the financial sector in nineteen. 73 we had 2.6 i was at a savings bank we just had deposits and mortgages and we finance just the little savings banks around the country finance 2.6 million housing starts with a 200 million population okay mm. 2.6 million today with 340 million people 
we've got 1.2 million housing starts and it's an unsustainable bubble. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, yeah, the financial yeah. sector is a parasite. It's just killing Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Okay, and the way, I've got ways to get rid of it. Number one, which is has other benefits, of course, which is not the problem, but a permanent zero rate policy eliminates all the bond trading. Bonds just stay at zero. You don't, don't let the treasury issue anything longer than a three month bill. And that's fine. You know, it's, it's not, it's um, deflationary. It's not an inflationary policy or anything else. And it gets rid of a big chunk of the financial sector that's adding to the, uh, the, spare, the income distribution problems, issues that we're facing. The other thing is no insured pension fund should be able to buy stocks. You know, that's, if, you, if you're right, you win. And if you're wrong, the government pays. It makes no sense. If you're an insured pension fund, you stay out of the equity markets. That eliminates, I don't know, two thirds of the volume, gets rid of a large chunk of that sector, right? And um, I don't know, I've got three or four other ways to, uh, you know, dramatically reduce the, uh, oh yeah, the banking. The bank should- Not as a modern debt. Yeah, not as a modern debt generally. Yeah, banks should, should only be allowed to do you tell the banks what they can do, not what they can't do, okay? <laughs> and then that eliminates a whole lot of problems with the banks. And they should only be lending on credit analysis, not not mark to market, and uh, not on collateral purpose. lending either. Yeah. Yeah. Right. For public purpose. And so the regulators have to determine whether any class of lending is not whether it's going to be profitable from the banks, but whether it suits public purpose. Otherwise, let the private sector do it. And, and so um, that can be dramatically reined in without dispute without having it without you know and, and and do go a lot to what you what i call shrinking the financial sector steve what you were talking about and uh i've got three or four more I'm not, I'm not modern debt jubilee to reduce the level of private debt and to increase the ownership of equities by the uh non-speculating public yeah i think financial assets the... financial assets should not qualify as collateral for banks there's no public purpose there you should mm. You know, where's the public purpose behind leveraging stocks or bonds? Or there isn't any. Uh, so why why would you let? Look, banks are agents of the state. They're not private sector any more than the military is. They're state chartered. Their deposits are insured, so it's all public money. The regulators can dismiss management. They can uh, they control asset quality. They control what the banks can do. It's like the military. Yeah, they let the soldier aim his gun left or right within a, a range, but it's still a public entity. Yes, the loan officer can price risk, but that's all he can do. And he's a public sector servant. And and when you're in banking and you own a bank, you know you're a public sector entity, just like the military. Uh, and with not a whole lot more. You get a public sector wage as well. Yeah, okay. And so, uh, yeah, and that's another issue, right? The whole corporate governance. Once you've got the, the government grants corporations uh, limited liability, that gives them enormous uh you know, justification, power, whatever you want to call it, to make sure they're serving public purpose. Otherwise, they can do it without limited liability. Let them be personal mm -hmm. liable if they're not serving public purpose. You know, so again, once you're a government, the whole reason government's there is public infrastructure for public purpose. And then it's about defining what constitutes public infrastructure and making sure it's for public purpose. And the whole legal structure is public infrastructure, including, um, limited liability for corporations. And that comes with it, the responsibility of making sure it serves public purpose. So anyway, I can get, I can talk for hours yeah. on this. And I won't. You guys, to be fair, we yeah. are 15 minutes over time. I don't normally do that, but I do have a request. I have one more question. Do, I, do I have to put another quarter in? What's that? Do I have to put another quarter in? <laughs> no, 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 I think you'd be all right. <laughs> but, but th this is a question that I think is, is um, it's more functional. And, and, and the question is this, for many, many years, the United States and other countries have, have not invested in their once built infrastructure. Yeah. Um, you know, any other asset that you have on the books, it, it depreciates, it, it comes off and it gets to zero. In the United States, we've got buildings, we've got pipes made of wood, we've got pipes made of clay, we've got pipes made of lead, we've got paper wrapped wires in our phone lines. We have not spent the money necessary to keep up. And if you think about it, any other thing, your car every day, you know, you've got to put oil, you've got to change your oil, you've got to change your spark plugs, you got to rotate your tires, you got to do all this stuff. We have not done that. Steve, and, hey, can you repeat right here to me? Can is, you repeat that, Steve? I'm I'm writing those things down for my car. Could you repeat them, please? <laughs> <laughs> the idea here is is that general maintenance 
to maintain the infrastructure that serves all of our needs. That, yeah. in, in my opinion, is a huge job program accidentally if we actually stuck to a real honest maintenance schedule that we would demand for our own lives. Why yeah. can't a government that has no means, an infinite means, if you will, why can a government not do that? Why are we sitting here with bridges and derated status? Point I'm making is, is that if yeah. we're spending on this, would I would consider to yeah. be definitely public purpose. Yeah. This right here changes everything. If we actually kept up with all of our infrastructure across the nation, jobs yeah. aplenty, blue collar jobs, good jobs, regular people jobs, nice pay, not $10 an hour, but $30, $40 an hour, real serious work. What what is it? Is it is it a mindset or, or what's an ideology? If you've got any, you've got an ideology of the marketplace, the market, best thing better than say, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. If it's an obsession with efficiency and not a not balanced by an equal obsession with robustness, and the government gives you that robustness, and by letting the debate be dominated by efficiency, we've basically lost that debate. So I think we need to talk about the need for a robust society as well as an efficient one. If you leave it on the efficiency basis, the neoclassical, the Austrians are always going to appear to win that argument ideologically, even though in the practical terms, what they do is they destroy the efficiency of the society they're talking about. Hey, Steve, the, the short answer is if you're asking that question, you must be new here. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good note well, to finish on, I think. I, I, I look at it like this. For the people watching, right, that don't understand how our government could make our economy fill the bathtub back up so that we're not in a false scarcity, that we could actually serve each other's needs, be able to take a day off without worrying about whether it's going to cost us our electric bill, et cetera. It seems like there's an awful lot of opportunity there. And I understand a lot of the nefarious reasons from the 70s and even before that created this lack of fiscal space. But I guess what I'm asking is for other people who aren't necessarily thinking about how spending fuels the economy and how, how it actually works. It seems to me like infrastructure for above all else, just maintaining it hey, Steve, is look, the greatest job you know, guarantee of all. Let, let, let's look at somebody 40 years old, right? They've got maybe 30 years of memory of, you know, of economic memory. And the bar has been set so low for these people. They think this is normal. This is what they were born into. This is how life is. They think this is how we're, you know, they don't see this as any kind of like a aberrant situation like you are. Now, you know, for somebody who grew up in the 50s and 60s, who knows what a good economy is, where in your second or third year of college, you had corporations lined up trying to hire you when you get out, you had infrastructure all over or something, like that. you know, it's a whole different thing. This young generation, I'm telling you, we've set the bar so low that they, they can't even imagine what you're talking about. Mm. That's true, unfortunately. But we have people, yeah. you get saturated by the current situation and think that's always yeah. been the way. Yeah, 20 years of this in Europe, and that's it. These people think that's normal life. Yeah, yeah. 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 My, like, I'm happy. It's the way it always is. All right, gentlemen. Well, yeah. look. Okay. Thank you so much for your time, both of you. Amazing, amazing people. I really am appreciative of this. S Professor Keene, I really do hope we can have you back on sometime in the future. And sure. Warren, of mm -hmm. course, thank okay. you so much. Anytime. Y'all keep okay. fighting a good fight out there. All right. Indeed, both sides. Okay, bye, guys. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone.